got some feedback from people both in house and online as far as where I should end things or what have you. I plan on continuing at least for a little bit after um, after the, a summer break. But what we typically do in the summer in this assembly is try to offer the time to other people to teach. That's partly so I can have a little bit of a break and partly so that others can develop some teaching skills. Um, and so uh, Bud usually takes advantage of these opportunities at least a couple times, sometimes uh, more than others. But he is going to teach the class today and tomorrow, and his topic today is the land promise. And I'm assuming you're talking here about the uh, Abrahamic covenant promise of the land, or I'm sure you'll make that clear. Yeah, it's we... more uh, related to current events. Okay. So uh, is this going to be a part one of two? Or are you going to do Potentially, something? Potentially, if we can talk okay. about that. So I don't want to take up Bud's time, but he's going he's gonna to teach a lesson today that he's calling The Land Promise. If you are on face, if you're on Facebook, if you're on YouTube, if you're on the church's website, if you go to gracelifebiblechurch.com, scroll down under Recent Lessons, and there's a link today for June 2nd. You can uh, access Bud's notes and follow along with him as he goes through this material. So, Bud, thanks for your volunteering, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Brian. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hi. Um, current event uh, today uh, got me thinking about things um, related to the Mideast, uh, the land, and people discussing the wars over there and so forth. And I got thinking, uh, from a biblical perspective, uh, what does the Bible say about the land and, you know, whose is it, who was there first, and, and how should we be thinking about current events and, and, and what's going on there. So um, that's the study today, the land promised. And uh, a great place to start uh, is Genesis 1.1. Uh, it says in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Uh, who created it? God created it. 1 Corinthians 10 26 says, For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So ultimately the land is whose? <laughs> it's God's land. The earth is the Lord's. Um, we can turn to Genesis 12, uh, 1 through 7, uh, and read that. Um, this is uh, now when the Lord is choosing Abraham, uh, Abram, out of the sea of people and calling him out to separate uh, and have a people for himself. And uh, he makes a covenant with Abram. I'll start reading here. Now the Lord hath said to Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Um, there's more to come. Uh, I'll keep reading. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. Now, this is key later in my talk uh, that he's seventy five years old at the time this covenant is made. So keep that in, in your mind. Um, and Abram took Sarah, his wife, uh, Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance uh, that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And into the land of Canaan they came, and Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sichem and the plain of Morah. And the Canaanite was then in the land. So take note of that. Uh, Abram's coming down from the north, from Haran, and there's people there. He, the Canaanites uh, are already there. 
And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto thy seed, Will I give this land? Now, is it his land to give? <laughs> It's the Lord's land. Uh, he can give it. So the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto thy seed will I give this land. Uh, another thing to notice is he says thy seed. And, uh, and there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Um, now um, Abraham continued on down to Egypt because of famine and uh, uh, reasons, he kept going. He kept walking through Canaan all the way to Egypt. And at some point he came back and he prospered and he had a lot of cattle and Lot was still with him and he had a lot of cattle too. And there came a point where um, the herdsmen uh, were saying, your cattle are eating, you know, Lot would say, your cattle are eating on where mine were supposed to eat, and they started to have a problem with just too much cattle, and so Lot separated away from Abram. Uh, Genesis 13, 9 through 18 talks about that. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. This is Abram talking to Lot. That note, if you're yes. following on the notes, they're stapled backwards. Uh -huh. That's why you can't find stuff. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Brian. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, that'll make that go smoothly as we go, go along. Um, if thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the Garden of the Lord. It looked like Garden of Eden over there. Uh, this would be um, the east side of the Jordan River along the Dead Sea. Um, at that time was green and uh, like the land of Egypt as thou comest unto Zor. It was nice, uh, fertile land there too. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves, the one from the other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. Um, I think it's interesting that Abram let Lot decide, and this is just how it ended up. Uh, and uh, so Abram's in Canaan. Uh, and the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth. So that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar to the Lord. Hebron is just south of Jerusalem, for those familiar with where Jerusalem is, a little bit south of there. So Abra, Abram uh, came up from Egypt that far, and this is where he has settled now. Um, I'm using my old notes here. Um, in 1876 BC, God's covenant concerning the land was made to Abram unconditionally. He just told Abram, this is it. Uh, he didn't say if you, you know, obey. And, and so this was unconditional. Uh, we just read that in Genesis 12, 7. Uh, let's look at Genesis 15, 18 also talks about it. <clears throat> in that same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river Egypt unto the great river, 
the river Euphrates. Um, so that's uh, the Euphrates, Tigris and Euphrates come up from the Persian Gulf, that's way east of you know, the Jordan River uh, into Mesopotamia. All that land from the Euphrates all the way to uh, Egypt, uh, maybe the Nile or a, a Wadi. Uh, so that whole area uh, God had in mind for the chosen people. Um, now we get to uh, Ishmael. Uh, made, he was made a great nation. So Abram had a son by Hagar. Uh, he was helping the Lord because of his great age. Him and Sarah decided to take things into their own hands. And, and if the seed, is, the promise, uh, has to go to somebody. And so they uh, had Ishmael. And uh, Genesis 21, 12, and 13 uh, talks about him and God said unto Abraham let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad um, um, he the lad Ishmael was a teenager and uh, the baby uh, Isaac uh, they had a, fe a festival uh, to wean the baby I think a, a better translation is uh, when the baby came of age, uh, became a person and a personality and made decisions. I think Isaac may have been about five years old and um, Ishmael mocked him. So there was some hatred and uh, uh, so uh, he had to leave. Sarah said, we're not going to put up with that. And, and the Lord agreed. And so he uh, told Abram to take him away. Uh, but let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman and all that Sarah has said unto thee. Hearken unto her voice. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And also the son of bondwoman will I make a nation because he is thy seed. So he's going to make a nation out of Ishmael, but the seed that is called is uh, through Isaac. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went, filled the bottle with water, and gave the lad a drink, and God was with the lad and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran. And his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. Uh, Paran now, uh, I think, is uh, southern, like so South Arabia. And, and so between Egypt and, and, and so Ishmael's got, back then, had that southern uh, place to to have. Um, now, uh, around 1800 BC, God's covenant concerning the land was made to Isaac, Abram's son, and that was also unconditional. Uh, he just makes that, and uh, we can uh, find that in Genesis 26, uh, 3 and 4. Take a look at that. <clears throat> sojourn in this land and I will be with thee and I will bless thee and uh, for unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father and uh, so uh, there we have that unconditional covenant with Isaac um, as will be shown, Isaac died before receiving the promise. It'll materialize at the start of the millennial kingdom, and it will be everlasting. Um, more about that later. Um, and then around 1740 BC, God's covenant concerning the land was made to Jacob, Isaac's son, unconditionally as well. Uh, that's why don't we look Genesis 35 12 
and the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, to thee I will give it, and to thy seed after thee will I give this land. So uh, moving on now, um, Jacob has been promised the land and there's famine there and he had to take everyone, the family, and go to where there's food. Uh, and uh, you know the story, Joseph the leader, uh, his son, his own son uh, in Egypt. And so they go down to Egypt um, and uh, for the sake of time, uh, I'll just move on that that uh, Jacob was there for a long time and, and he died. And Joseph uh, wanted to bury him, not in Egypt, but where he called home, Jacob, the promised land. So... Uh, Genesis 50, uh, verse 7, and also verses 11 through 14 uh, says, And Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt. And when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning in the floor of Atad, they said, this is a grievous mourning to the Egyptians, wherefore the name of it was called Abel Mizraim, which is beyond the Jordan. Beyond the Jordan, if you can think of Israel, uh, from north to south, the Jordan River runs from the Sea of Galilee to the Dead Sea, and where they're located right now is beyond the Jordan. So you're wondering, from Egypt, you go up to the Jordan, you know, there's, if you go along the Mediterranean Sea and over, then beyond the Jordan's on the east side of, of there. But they didn't go that way. They went the same way that later, when the Exodus, Moses would take them, they come up on the other side of the Jordan. And so the other side of the Jordan, in this case, is on the west side. And there's reasons they did that that we will find later. Um, and his sons did unto him according as he commanded them, for his sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah, which, Abram, which Abraham bought with the field for a possession of a burying place of Ephraim the Hittite before Mamre. And Joseph returned into Egypt, he and his brethren, and all that went up with him to bury his father after he had buried his father. So that uh, land of Mamre might sound familiar. We read that earlier. And this cave of Machpelah is in Hebron. So Abraham had been there before uh, and bought this land. And now Joseph, all the years later, has come back uh, to bury Jacob there in that same area. It's interesting, too. Um, that Abra Abraham purchased the land. Uh, that land had been promised to him, right? But he purchased it. Um, the same land had been promised to him. Also Jacob, which his name was changed to Israel later, that's Jacob, uh, and Joseph. In their old age, they expressed interest in being buried in the promised land. They all wanted to be buried there. Undoubtedly, they all had in mind a future manifestation of the promises. So they maybe weren't looking for that to be their possession in their own lifetime. They knew uh, that uh, this was something yet future um, and more spiritual. Um, we can read in the New Testament about this. And uh, this was a great find as I did my study. Hebrews 11, 8 through 22, I'll read this. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place 
which you should, after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So a city made without hands, you could say. This is what they were looking for. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one and him as good as dead, that's Abram, uh, Abraham, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude and as the sand which is by the sea shore uh, innumerable. These all died in faith not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of the country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. So now uh, we're thinking of the land a little bit differently. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he had received, uh, he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac, shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning upon the top of his staff. By faith Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. So here's Joseph now himself um, is going to die, and he's saying before he's dying, uh, I want to also be in the promised land, uh, so take my bones there. And he knew, Joseph knew before he died, that in the future, um, the the Israelites will be allowed to leave Egypt and go to the promised land. So um, 1661 B.C., Genesis 50, verse 24 through 26. Let's look at that. Um, and this is when Joseph is still living. Joseph said unto his brethren, I die and God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel saying, God will surely visit you and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. So Joseph died being 110 years old and they embalmed him and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Um, just a note here, uh, this is 1661 is when Jacob brought the Israelites, uh, there were I think 70 in number, uh, from the promised land to Egypt. And then they grew and became slaves and uh, in bondage. Uh, so their coming there was 1661. Um, if you flip back in your notes, when Abraham or Abram, on page two on my notes, uh, maybe uh, on yours is page one at the bottom. 1876 is when uh, the covenant was made 
in Genesis 12, 7, the covenant was made with Abraham 1876. If you do the math from 1876 BC to uh, 1661 BC, that's 215 years. Okay. Uh, the Exodus itself now, it just happens to be 215 years later. So uh, that's 1446 BC. Uh, historians can show that is when the Exodus happened. And uh, I think it's amazing that, that uh, scripture can have this dividing line directly in half uh, for a total of 430 years. Uh, from when Abraham first sojourned uh, in Egypt to when they leave. Uh, so a lot of people think Israel was in bondage for 430 years. And uh, in a sense they were when Ishmael harassed Isaac. Uh, that was the beginning of what you might consider harassment. <laughs> Uh, and, and bondage uh, there uh, and that's more like 400 years of, of, of a problem like that but the total um, from when Abraham went uh, to Egypt and, and sojourned there uh, would be 430 years to when they left uh, 1446 Exodus 13 uh, verse 7 through 20, and it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God let, led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, let peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. See, same thing here. They're not going up from Egypt along the Mediterranean the easy way back to the promised land they're going all the way around the Dead Sea and coming in over the Jordan um, so same thing here um, uh, but God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea and the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt uh, that just means orderly uh, orderly out of the land of Egypt and Moses took the bones of Joseph with him and uh, for he had straightly sworn the children of Israel saying God will surely visit you and ye shall carry my bones away hence with you and they took their journey from Succoth and then camped in Etham in the edge of the wilderness um, in the New Testament now uh, Stephen summarizes this in uh, Acts 7 Let's look at Acts 7, verse 1 through 8. Then said the high priest, Are these things so? And he said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Haran, and said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I shall show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land where ye now dwell. And he gave him none inheritance in it. No, not much, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him when as yet he had no child. So these promises were made and yet in their lifetime they didn't even get a little piece to even put their foot on. And God spake, spake on this wise that his seed should sojourn in a strange land and that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil 400 years this is the treating evil part uh, from Ishmael's mocking, uh, not from Abraham's sojourn. So only 400 years here. We got 430, remember, uh, otherwise. Um, so there's a question coming. Yes. Up. 
have a question. It seems to me that the question is related to the 400 years. Okay. So when it says in Genesis 15, 13, and shall serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years, and then Stephen is recounting this in Acts 7, 6, um, and they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil for 400 years. You're saying, if I'm hearing you right, that, that 400 years is not 400 total years of Egyptian slavery? How are you counting no, the no, it, How are you counting the 400 years? Yeah. Uh, the slavery part is key. The bondage, the affliction, that is what the 400 years, but... Uh, so you're counting that starting with Ishmael mocking Jacob. Yes, that's 400 no, years Isaac. mocking um, Isaac. Isaac. Yes, mocking Isaac. Yes. You're saying it's 400 years from the time that he mocked Isaac until Moses leaves the Egypt? Yes. yes. Yes, 400 years of affliction and evil treatment. Um, there were 30 years previous uh, that wasn't so bad. That was just the sojourn, generally speaking. Abraham, because of the famine, sojourned in Egypt, it says. And then they left 430 years later, 400 of which were evil treatment. Okay. So you're not you're not saying that the 400 is specific to Egyptian slavery. You're saying the 400 is specific to evil treatment. Well, right, but but you're saying Egyptian slavery is is bad treatment. But the 30 years uh, between uh, the the mocking and, and the sojourn original didn't have any negativity. Abraham didn't experience affliction and bondage and so forth. He, he wasn't harassed by anyone. So I, I think I'm not, I'm just trying to understand how you're counting. Okay, that. yeah. And I think the, the question then is related to, I think most people have typically felt like the 400 years was that they were literally in Egypt 400 years under slavery. And you're saying, right. you seem to be saying that the time is counted different than that. No. Uh, I don't know, the, I yeah, let me, let me explain. Uh, 1661 B.C. is when the bondage started, the slavery. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, that's what you were trying to get me to. 1661 is when Jacob came to see his son Joseph as a ruler, and they, they uh, eventually became in slavery. So I start counting when Jacob brought the children of Israel to Egypt. That starts the 400 years. Okay, that makes more sense to me. Yeah. To well, I, I mean, that starts the 215 years. The 400 years has to start with Isaac being harassed. Okay. Yeah, and, and so, see, there's 215 years from the original sojourn to 1661. So, 215 years. From that 215 years is also harassment. <laughs> You see, uh, part of the harassments from 1661 on to 1446, and and the rest of the harassment is from 1661 B.C. to when Ishmael was harassed, or Ishmael harassed Isaac. Okay. I, you can go on. I just there, there were some questions even in the comments on YouTube okay. about how you were counting the yeah. 400 years. Yeah, um, so to summarize that little part, uh, um, Abraham sojourned uh, 
1876 BC, he went to Egypt, uh, and for 30 years he was comfortable, and uh, he had his son Isaac finally, and five years later, uh, see he was 100 years old when he had the baby, right? Isaac was 100 years old. And remember, he went to Haran, or from Haran to Egypt in 1876, and he was 75 years old. So 75 years old when he first got there to sojourn. 25 years later, he's 100 years old, and he's having that baby. He's having Isaac. Isaac. Yeah. And Isaac grew five more years. So now you've got the 25 years from 75 to 100, and now Isaac grows to five more years and becomes into a person and makes decisions, and that's called weaning. He's weaned five years, so that's 30 years. That's the 30-year difference when Scripture says in a couple places it's 430 years. Uh, in Galatians, uh, 430 years. Uh, and so uh, that's why in one place it'll say 430 and another place it says 400. They're not rounding the 430, oh, let's round it to 400. No, it's specific. And I was excited doing this study. I f had to figure that out, the 25 years between uh, his sojourn and and uh, and the... Uh, Har uh, harassment. Um, so can I repeat back? The to thirty you? years. Can I repeat back to you what I'm hearing yes. you say? And you tell yes. Yes. I've got it right. Okay. At seventy-five years old, Abraham Abraham moved goes to Egypt. Yep. He has Isaac at a hundred years old. Yep. Five years after that, when Isaac is five years old, he's harassed by Ishmael. Yes. That harassment by Ishmael begins the counting of the 400 years. Yes. The 30 additional years is the difference between Abraham going there at 75 yes. and Ishmael being harassed, sorry, Isaac being harassed by yep. Ishmael at five years old. Yep. That's, that's yep. what, okay. Yep. I, I, I just, I was a jumble of numbers and I yeah. was Fine. Yeah, this is uh, uh, all new. And, and, uh, so did I summarize it accurate? Yes, you did. Uh, you've got that now. And I hope everyone uh, maybe will have to watch this again <laughs> to uh, get it straight. Um, so that's, uh, where did I leave off here? Um, let's see. Uh, that his seed should sojourn in a strange land. Uh, this was Stephen talking. Uh, they bring them into bondage and entreat them evil 400 years and the nation uh, to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge said God and after that they shall come forth and serve me in this place and he gave him a, the covenant of circumcision and so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised in the eighth day, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat the 12 patriarchs. So I'm going through all this so you see the promised land, or the land promised. Um, uh, this is why the 12 uh, patriarchs and their descendants have a attachment to this land you know, we call Israel today. Uh, the descendants of Ishmael, Keturah, uh, that's Abraham's second wife, and Esau were not to claim the promises made to Israel. They received their own special blessings. The unbelieving Israelite will not receive the same inheritance as the believing remnant, nor can Gentile believers, that's us, who are spiritual seed of Abraham, lay claim to the promise of the land of Canaan. We are God's heavenly people. Amen? Amen. Amen. The promise of Canaan belongs to Israel alone. Now we're entering the land, uh, Deuteronomy 9, 5 through 6, 
not for thy righteousness or for the uprightness of thine heart dost thou go to possess their land, but for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee, and that he may perform the word which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand therefore that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for thy righteousness, for thou art a stiff-necked people. So let's get this straight. Uh, don't feel sorry for those who were in Canaan. Uh, they were nasty. Yeah. Uh, uh, you think of ISIS and and uh, all the enemies uh, uh, that we know, uh, terrorism in the world. Uh, this is the people of Canaan uh, were, were the worst. And so uh, God was going to drive them out and put his people in the land. <clears throat> um, Deuteronomy 34, 1 through 4, And Moses went up from the plains of Moab unto the mountain of Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, uh, that is over against Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead unto Dan. And the Lord said unto him, This is the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give it to thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. Um, I have a picture of the view from Mount Nebo uh, looking to the west, and you really can't see the entire um, Holy Land. You can't see all the way to Dan in the north. You can't even really see the Mediterranean straight across. Um, uh, Mount Nebo is, is by the Jordan, let's say, on the east side of, of Canaan and the land of Israel. And as you look to the west, you would hope to see at least the Mediterranean Sea in the distance. What is it, like 10 miles or something? Uh, and... Uh, but you can't. If you look to the south, you can see Jerusalem, 25 miles away, uh, and Jericho down closer, and uh, and it just looks like you can see forever. But you wonder how literally to take this verse. Um, one way you could take it literally um, that he showed him all the land, uh, even unto Dan, would be that after. Moses passed because Moses passed right around this time right and maybe the Lord showed him you know the view from above let's say even higher but that's speculation I think you get the idea he showed him the land I think it's probably somewhat figurative right yeah because when Satan takes the Lord into a high mountain yes all the yes the same the thing mountain. same thing yes good point um so have you actually been there? Were you actually there? Oh, uh, not on Nebo. No, no. You said if you looked one way, you could go, you couldn't see any more than 10 miles? Yes. 25 miles towards Jerusalem? Yes. Is that, is that because of topography? Yes. Uh, it's mountainous, oh, okay. and uh, uh, let's say some of the mountains and the curvature of the earth comes into play. Uh, so that's why I'm sorry flat for you flat earthers, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, uh, you can't see that far, you know, without it disappearing. So, um, well, I'll continue on here. I'm at the top of a page on my old notes here. At the bottom of this page, it says 30 minutes, and uh, <laughs> I'm way behind. So yes, there will be a part two. Uh, I'll bet. Uh, no, that's okay. And I was hoping we'd have a lot of questions. And please uh, keep the questions coming. And uh, I'll just continue as far as I can. Uh, we've got another uh, 15 minutes or so. Uh, let's go to Numbers, uh, chapter 33, verse 50 through 53, and then 55 through 56. And the Lord's speak unto Moses in the plains of Moab by Jordan near Jericho, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, 
when ye are passed over Jordan into the land of Canaan, then ye shall drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their pictures, destroy their molten images, and quite pluck down all their high places, and ye shall dispossess this, uh, the inhabitants of the land and dwell therein, for I have given you the land to possess it. But if ye will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall become to uh, it shall come to pass that those which ye let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides, and shall vex you in the land wherein you dwell. Moreover, it shall come to pass that I shall do unto you as I thought to do unto them. He wants Israel to wipe out those bad people. Uh, Deuteronomy 25, 17 through 19. Remember what um, Amalek did unto thee by the way when ye were come, out, come forth out of Egypt, how he met thee by the way and smote the hindmost of thee, even all that were feeble and behind thee when thou was faint and weary and he feared not God. He didn't care. He's killing old men and, and babies and women from the back that can't keep up. And uh, this is uh, Amalek, uh, really bad. Uh, Therefore it shall be when the Lord thy God have given thee rest from all thine enemies round about in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Thou shalt not forget it. Judges 2, 1 through 3. And the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal. Now this is, they're in the promised land now. And uh, they've had some time. And the angel of the Lord came and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt and have brought you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down their altars. But ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Wherefore I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. Now, uh, we're going to start to touch on things that... Uh, have practical application, and uh, um, I'm going to keep reading. I got, I got something I'd like to share. That yes, um, like I say, I, I watch lots of YouTube videos and that, and, and uh, where uh, a Christian apologist will be up there, and a lot of the atheists will use this argument against God saying well if God is so loving you know why why is he killing all these people you know and even babies and that but that that's an argument that the atheists like to use yeah to, to show that God's not yeah. a good, loving God because why is yes. he killing his people yes it, yes <laughs> how could a loving God uh, a command that you wipe out uh, an entire country you know all these people and then put his own people in there and that's why I read those verses earlier and I'm trying to stress how terrible the people in the land were they were murderous well, and um, they were committing infanticide they were involved in all yes. manner of even even some sin that today, by even today's standards, people would balk at. Yeah, yeah. Like these are wicked. Were these yeah, gods yeah. that would put the babies on a molten? Yeah. yeah. Like oh yeah, all that. that. Yes. Statues and yes. So uh, and and there's a spiritual aspect of this. You know, we fight not against flesh and blood, uh, but. Uh, in fact, I would say even Israel balked at this because the reason you have the book of Judges is yeah. because they didn't do what God told them it, to do. Exactly. And, and these Gentiles were allowed to exist and be thorns in their sides. Exactly. Briars in their eyes or whatever. It's yeah. Like. Now, this is a perfect time to move on here. Uh, the judges failed miserably uh, by letting 
uh, they just didn't take care of business, let's say. So now Israel wants a king, and they get a king, and it's Saul. Uh, 1 Samuel 15, 1 through 3. Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thou sayest the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all they have and spare him not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. What did Saul do? He had his opportunity. 1 Samuel 15, verse 8 through 11. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag, and the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of the fatlings, and the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse that they destroyed, that they destroyed utterly. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he's turned back from following me, <clears throat> and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. Well, we know uh, David is made king now after this, and uh, um, this would be a good time to, to uh, um, close uh, with some comments now, uh, and next time uh, we'll start when David becomes king, and uh, there was a covenant made with him, and uh, we can go on from there. Uh, this lesson is going to take us all the way to the end of the millennium and into eternity future. So I've got a lot to talk about in, uh, in the next time. Um, but I just wanted to get comments from you and thoughts on you. Um, how does Saul and what he did or didn't do, how does that relate today? And um, Benjamin Yahoo, uh, Netanyahu, Netanyahu um, is faced with Amalek. Hamas is nothing short of Amalek, if you ask me, and, and especially in a spiritual sense. And I'm trying not to be political here at church and so forth, but I'm afraid I've already stepped into it, and and so. Um, these are just my thoughts, my personal opinion, that there's a spiritual aspect of Amalek in this current situation. Hamas is um, evil, and Netanyahu's familiar with this story of Saul, and Saul's opportunity, and Saul's missed opportunity. And now... Um, um, Netanyahu is uh, he's been invited this weekend to accept an invitation from bipartisan congressional leadership to address a joint meeting of the House and Senate and they're going to beg him to accept a ceasefire and um, I sympathize with these people who are dying on all sides. The war is terrible. This is all terrible. Um, but as Netanyahu would say, there can be no permanent ceasefire until Hamas's military and governing capabilities are destroyed. And so uh, President Biden wants him to stop short of destroying Amalek. <laughs> And so I just, if you look at it from this perspective, uh, from what we've learned today, um, you can almost feel for Netanyahu and, and think that, you know, if you were thinking before, yeah, he should stop this, 
and and let Hamas, you know, let some of them go, and and maybe they'll be good, and and the, everything can get back to normal. But I almost can see what Netanyahu is thinking here. Uh, he doesn't want to be another Saul. Uh, so with that, I'm going to close, and I, I hope I haven't stirred the hornet's nest too horribly today. Um, Any questions? There is a question here. Some people are requesting um, some kind of a visual timeline on your 400, 430 years. Um, yeah. So maybe if you have time this week, you can... Oh yeah, that's add a, add a timeline to the front of the notes or something. I'd be delighted. Uh, it is plain to see uh, when I make that timeline, and uh, <laughs> shameless plug. <laughs> I've got this book with these dates. You wonder how I come to these dates. 1876 BC, he came into the land, and 1661, and so forth. I figured it out, uh, it took me years, and I, I put it in the book there, uh, uh, From Adam to Messiah the Prince, and I have a timeline in there. And so, uh, uh, shameless plug, I won't apologize, you need to, you need to have it. <laughs> Thank you. All right, thanks bud. Uh, looking forward to part two. Um, I'll tell you where you can get a copy of the uh, From Adam to the Messiah, the Prince. Uh, you can buy this at the gracelifepress.com bookstore. That is the online bookstore of Grace Life Bible Church where you can get all of my books as well as this uh, published book by Bud. This was done by Dispensational Publishing House last summer. And I know there's a timeline in here, but others don't know. And it would be good probably to just take the parts that's relevant to the oh, yeah. to the study and uh, put that in there for next time. All right, appreciate everybody online tuning in. Uh, we'll be back again next Sunday, but we'll give part two. Um, and uh, hopefully you found that uh, interesting.